Hello everyone, this is Professor Hall. We are back with a close reading of The Gilded Six Bits. Now, if you did not already, please go back and watch the first presentation about Zora Neale Hurston, which just covers a little bit of her life and influences because we talk about things like her childhood and teen years, which were spent in Eatonville, Florida, an all-incorporated Black community, and how her work as an anthropologist really um, affected her writing later on as an author. So um, let's dig into this story. I love it so much. Okay. I don't know if you can tell how excited I am. All right, let's go. So Gilded Six Bits Summary. Um, we have Missy May, and she awaits her husband, Joe, as he comes home from work. So every day she waits for him and they have like a little ritual where he tosses her silver dollars. She picks them up and she chases him to find whatever little present he's brought home for her that day. Uh, so she's a, a traditional stay at home uh, wife and she's uh, waiting on her husband to come home. They meet up with a new seemingly wealthy man named Otis. Missy at first is unimpressed by Otis, but then she realizes that he might have money. He wears this uh, very uh, flashy clothing and he wears on a chain, a gold piece kind of to say like, here's, you know, I have a lot of money. Joe finds Missy in bed with Otis. She claims that she only slept with him to get money out of him, um, but it kind of breaks their marital bliss. Up until this time, they've been really close and loving, and now um, this has happened. So Otis leaves. Joe does not leave Otis. Uh, Joe does not leave Missy, but he keeps the coin Otis paid her, and it really ruins their marriage. She kind of keeps thinking, why is he torturing me like this? Why doesn't he just leave? Does he not love me anymore? That kind of thing. Um, we find out later as Missy finds out that the money was fake. It was gilded, meaning it was like painted gold and it was just a six bit coin. Joe is able to forgive her. They have a child together and they go back to their happy life. That's just kind of the overview. And obviously a lot more happens in there, but I just wanted to kind of give you the broad strokes of everything. So I want to talk a little bit about literary theory um, and then apply it to this story. So we have a, a theory in literature and in film called the gaze. There we go. Basically, um, it starts with the idea that when a person is being watched, they may begin to act differently. For example, we have... Um, up here, people in a prison, this is called a panopticon. The guards are in the center. All of the cells can be seen from that center post. That means that the guards could be watching what's going on in any cell at any time. This causes a lot of paranoia for the people in the prison. Um, the idea is that then they will behave better, but it also gives a lot of power to the people here, right? Because they're watching all the people at all times and they can then dole out punishments or uh, what have you. You can think also, whoops. You can think also about uh, surveillance. Uh, we have a lot of uh, cameras everywhere, right? With somebody watching those cameras, watching everything going on. We also have things today in the workplace post COVID like um, uh, screen capturing software or keystroke capturing where um, I know people who work for uh, someone where their boss is able to see exactly how many times they typed their keys, what they typed, how long they were on, how long they were off, um, whether their mouse was just you know, moving around or whether they were actually doing work, right? So that is kind of the the general idea here, that um, prisoners would become paranoid and curb certain discussions or behaviors, that employees would behave and be more productive. Um, and it also implies that the people doing the watching are judging, they are watching, but they're also making judgments about the people they are watching. So there's a power dynamic in which they have basically more power and authority because everything is seen through their perspective, right? If you 
see that an employee didn't log on for an hour, you're going to make a judgment about that and maybe think that they're lazy, but you're not seeing it from the employee's perspective that maybe they had an emergency phone call and they had to take that or they had to uh, run out for something and, uh, you know, something happened. You're looking at it only through one perspective. So later people take this idea and apply it to literature and art. And in the 1970s, they begin to look at what's called the male gaze. So basically that's saying that in art and movies, women are looked at voyeuristically and they're objectified from a male perspective. I picked these two because their position is not that much different, right? Um, we have this artist depiction here of a woman um, and she is looking lovely and beautiful. She is the center of attention. Um, all of her features are very prominent but it's obviously not through her perspective of lying on a cold ground waiting for an artist to paint you, right? Similarly, we have movies where um, the woman is just the object of attraction or affection, and she has very little role other than for the man to chase her and, and have her as a conquest. So that comes into, um, around the same time, the idea of a post-colonialist or imperial gaze. So that sort of says, uh, here's a quote, the imperial gaze reflects the assumption that white Western culture is central. So it's centralizing whiteness, and then it's looking at um, people of color as exotic, as different, as um, not the same. And when it views people from other cultures through that lens of that white experience, essentially it leads to depictions of people and characters who are inauthentic. It puts the white male Western perspective in a position of power, and it says that everybody else is other. Um, and this is extremely important because... It sets up a power dynamic in which certain people or cultural groups are seen as dominant and correct um, and that they should have um, power to judge and uh, decide what is right and wrong in terms of other cultural norms. It also depicts women and people of color through a, a lens of experience that's not their own. And it leads to false assumptions, stereotypes, racism, sexism. So what happens in uh, around the time that we're looking at the 1920s and 30s, you get shows like Amos and Andy, which was a very popular radio show um, featuring two African-American characters who were played by white men. And they later also depicted them in a movie wearing blackface. So taking this black experience and uh, twisting it and writing it from a white point of view and then making the characters kind of into jokes um, and not depicting them um, authentically in a very, very racist way. Uh, similarly, we have a movie like Gone with the Wind and also the book where the experience of here, um, Mammy, is really only seen through the eyes of the white protagonist, Scarlett, and the white writer, Margaret Mitchell, that you have um, people who basically are their slaves, but they're happy and they're being taken care of by the kind white Southerners who are genteel and kind of aristocratic. So you can see why this would be an, a problem. And we even have it today. We have, um, you know, movies and books like The Help, where um, it's written by a white woman who sort of co-opted the story of one of the women who was a, a servant for her family and wrote this book, The Help, and was later sued by that woman saying, like, you basically took my stories and wrote them from a white perspective. Um, Me Before You is a story about someone who is uh, differently abled, and it's implied that his his life is not really worth anything because of his disability, um, and this is a protest against it, saying our lives are not a tragedy, we live boldly by staying alive. So again, if you're not experiencing it, why are you trying to write about it? So we have a push right now 
for something called Diverse Books and Own Voices, where people are looking to publish things that are written by the people who experienced them. So, um, for example, I had an eating disorder when I was a teenager. I wrote a book about a teenager with eating disorders, in part because books written by people who did not have eating disorders got so much stuff wrong um, because of this gaze of like looking at it like a, a, in a certain way. And similarly, um, you have uh, a real need for people of certain color cultures to tell their own stories. People of different ethnicities need to be there as a voice. And Zora Neale Hurston was one of the first people really to try to do this. And this story, I think, is a great example of it. So she starts, and here are pictures of Eatonville, the all-incorporated black town. Um, it's a black space. This is how the story begins. It was I'm also, I'm reading the language that they used here at the time. It was a Negro yard around a Negro house in a Negro settlement that looked to the payroll of G&G &G Fertilizer Works for its support. But there was something happy about the place. The front yard was parted in the middle by a sidewalk from gate to doorstep, a sidewalk edged on either side by quart bottles driven neck down into the ground by a slant. A mess of homey flowers planted without a plan, but blooming cheerily from their helter shelter places. The fence and house were whitewashed. The porch and steps were scrubbed white. The front door stood open to the sunshine. So she's trying to show the perspective of her as an African American writer. This is a beautiful, happy, sunshiny home. Um, with oh, oh, basically, you know, the white, the white picket fence in the front uh, surrounding the house and the beautiful porch out front. Um, again, a lot different from prevailing racist attitudes at the time that would have looked at um, African Americans possibly as being uh, unhappy or uh, dirty or other. Again, that's what she's trying to fight against. And she's showing that this is pretty much for most of the story just about <clears throat> just about the African-American community and that white people really don't have anything to do with it. And it's really important because that comes up toward the end of the story as well. So we also have authentic characters. We, we're moving from setting now to characters. Missy May was bathing herself in the galvanized wash tub in the bedroom her dark brown skin glistening under the soap suds that skittered down from her wash rag. Her stiff young breasts thrust forward aggressively like broad-based cones with the tips lacquered black. Author Valerie Boyd writes, Hurston breaks ranks with other writers of her day by creating in Missy May a black female character who is sexually aggressive and transgressive, but who is not a whore, fitting into none of the predominant stereotypes of black women, Mammy, Tragic Mulatto, Promiscuous Jezebel. She is a lot of things, like many people are, right? She's extremely complex. And here we get her bathing herself in a very sensual way, depicting black beauty and redefining kind of standards of what they should be, right? Outside of whatever it means to be white, outside of all, uh, the predominant gaze, outside of all of that, this is just a beautiful woman having a bath. And um, we see how sensual she is and how much she loves her husband, but also how she might want a few things more out of life and that money might bring her, right? So she's not... Uh, she's transgressive, meaning she has an affair, but that doesn't make her a horrible person. That's just something that happens in the story. That's basically what uh, the critic here is saying. And we have complex relationships, just like we have complex characters. Joe said calmly, Missy May, you cry too much. Don't look back like, wa li like Lot's wife and turn into salt. The sun, the hero of every day, the impersonal old man that beams as brightly on death as on birth, came up every morning and raced across the blue dome and dipped into the sea of fire every morning. Water ran downhill and birds nested. Missy knew why she didn't leave Joe. She couldn't. She loved him too much. But she could not understand why Joe didn't leave her. 
He was polite, even at times, even kind at times, but aloof. There were no more Saturday romps, no ringing silver dollars to stack beside her plate, no pockets to rifle. In fact, the yellow coin in his trousers was like a monster hiding in the cave of his pockets to destroy her. So we have a biblical allusion here with looking back like Lot's wife turning into salt. Uh, Lot and his wife are leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, a place of uh, great uh, dissipation and sin, uh, particularly sexual sin. He is looking forward, not wanting to return. She looks back, wanting to kind of go back there and is turned into a pillar of salt. Uh, so it brings about her demise because she wanted that again. So he's kind of saying that to her. You cry too much. Don't look back uh, like Lot's wife. Don't want to go back to that moral degradation that you allowed yourself to go into. We have great imagery here, the passing of time, and then this complex relationship um, that I think is really realistic to... Uh, everyday life that um, things have happened and that they're kind of separated even though they're living under the same house and in the in the same house under the same roof we also have authentic dialects now this is something that Hurston was kind of criticized for later because a lot of people saw this as sort of racist depiction but I think a lot of that criticism came about much later because at the time, she, again, is just trying to show the authentic life and the authentic way of speaking um, that was around her. I love this little quote from Professor Stuart Davis. African-American English should not be stigmatized. It's a legitimate dialect and it has grammatical complexity that's underappreciated. I do also want to say a lot of students struggle with this part of the story. So it's another reason I wanted to mention it. Uh, I went down to the store to get a box of lye and I seen him standing on the corner talking to some of the men's and I come on the back. I come on back and went to scrubbing the floor and he passed and tipped his hat whilst I was scouring the steps. I thought I never seen him before. You really have to kind of read it like it's a, a, a text message almost. Um, so a lot of, um, words that end shortly a lot of dropped h's dropped g's that kind of thing ah uh, instead of i um d instead of the but she's trying to really capture the flavor of how these characters would talk um joe smiled pleasantly yeah he's up to date he got the finest clothes i ever seen on a color man's back Aw, oh, he don't look no better in his clothes than you do in yourn. He got a puzzle gun on him, and he's so chuckle-headed, he got a pone behind his neck. Now, a pone refers to a corn pone uh, that it, it's kind of like saying he has a little bit of a hump back and a puzzle gut at that time. It's kind of slang for, like, having a pot belly, right? So um, when you read it, if you want, if you're struggling with it, I just recommend reading it out loud and kind of hearing how, how things sound. And you can kind of sound them out in that way. But I think that this really does add authenticity that is already there in the complex characters and relationships. It just kind of gives it another layer. Now, it's not till the very end of the story that we have the intrusion of the white gaze. But um, what's interesting to me about this is that it's more like Hurston is kind of gazing back and making comment on what comments the white characters make. So there is a white store owner out of town uh, where Joe goes to buy some of his goods. And he says, 50 cents buys a mighty lot of candy kisses, Joe. Why don't you split it up and take some chocolate bars too? They eat good too. And he says, yes, they do. But I want all that and kisses. I got a little boy child home now. It ain't a week old. He ain't a week old yet, but he's he can suck a sugar tit and maybe eat one of those kisses himself. I don't recommend giving chocolate to a week old baby, but there it is. <laughs> anyway, Joe got his candy and left the store. The Turk, the clerk turned to the next customer. Wish I could be like these darkies laughing at all the time. Nothing worries them. Back in Eatonville, Joe reached his own front door. There was the ring of singing metal on wood, 15 times. 
Missy May couldn't run to the door, but she kept, crept there as quickly as she could. Joe Banks, I hear you chunking money in my way. You wait till I got my strength back, and then I'm going to fix you for that. So, what happens here is that Joe has a lot of money. Um, he wants the kisses because they're simpler. And now maybe he is making money, but he doesn't need the bigger things in life, like the chocolate bars. So that's the first thing that this clerk doesn't understand. The second thing is that um, Joe talks about his child, but really he's getting the candy for his wife. And a lot of time has passed. The clerk is like, oh, they're just laughing all the time. Nothing worries them. All these black people, that's just how they are. They're just very simple, not like my complicated life. And has no idea what has actually been going on in this man's life. So we're looking really from a black perspective at a, at a white man who is incredibly racist and ignorant, right? He is like, they're laughing all the time. Nothing worries them. Joe has had an incredible amount of worries, an incredible amount of stress and pain and grief over what's been going on in his marriage and what's been going on in his relationship and whether he'll be able to heal it. And also a young child is now in the picture, right? And then we have back in Eatonville. So we go back to this space that is just for blacks where they can be outside of this racist white gaze and then the story kind of resumes. So I really love this this um, this particular point in the story and I think it's really important. Writer Evora Jones explains about the clerk's comment. The simple life is meaningful to the inhabitant, not to the observer. For as the clerk erroneously sums up Joe's life, he, the clerk, fails to locate the true pulse of simplicity, serenity, and peace of mind inherent in the rural life of Joe and Missy May. The real pulse of simplicity is feeling experience. Sublime. The problem here is that their life isn't simple, right? He's trying to get back to a simpler time. Bell Hooks, also a great writer, and she's not talking specifically about this story, but I do think it applies here. All attempts to repress our black people's right to gaze has produced in us an overwhelming longing to look, a rebellious desire, an oppositional gaze. By courageously looking, we defiantly declared, not only will I stare, I want to look to change my reality. Spaces of agency exist for black people wherein we can both interrogate the gaze of the other and also look back at one another, naming what we see. And that is basically what's going on in this part of the story. I want to say, really importantly, that's not the only thing that's going on. But I do want to just kind of, you know, point that out. And there she is uh, in her anthropological role, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, beating a drum. But there are a lot of themes in this story. Uh, the white gaze piece is really a small piece of it, but I think a very important one for her message. Having said that, other themes that are much more prominent and important, appearance versus reality, infidelity and betrayal, simplicity and complexity, contentment and greed, family bonds and love, and forgiveness and redemption. So as you go to read, um, kind of be aware of some of the things that she's doing, but also look for these themes. How do we see the characters interacting with them? What might her message be to readers? Um, what is she trying to convey with this amazing short story? That's it. I can't wait to read your thoughts. Thanks, everybody.